In the Perspectrum podcast, we discuss controversial topics. Outside of this context, Michael and I are both working professionals. While doing the show, we are not acting as agents or representatives of our respective institutions. And none of the views that we express reflect the outlooks of our employers. So don't come to my office and throw toilet paper at me. And I don't have an office, but don't come to my cube. Hello and welcome to The Perspectrum. I'm Michael Bloom. And I'm Nathan Seelove. And today on the podcast, we um, yeah, pretty much nothing important to talk about. We'll just kind of <laughs> shoot the shit. And, uh, <laughs> um, no heart-rending, uh, exhausting, yeah. like... Uh, political drivel for us to talk about it so i guess we'll just wrap it up here thanks for so much for listening to the perspective and you'll hear from us again next week (laughs) 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 god you know (laughs) there with every fiber of my being i wish you were being serious right now (laughs) like i wish Uh, with all of my heart that i did not witness that horror show last night (laughs) yeah me too. Uh, for anybody who might not know, if you have been living under a rock for like 24 hours or 48 by the time you hear this, we're talking about the first presidential debate between Trump and Biden. Yeah. A true horror show. And that will be, with, with the exception of a couple of short segments and COVID numbers, that will be our whole conversation today. Yeah. We'll be focusing on, on the debate. And part of that is we're going to break it down so in case you actually have some self-respect and you didn't watch it, um, you can at least get ca- caught up on it. And we'll try to address some of the more glaring factual questions just to, like, sort out, um, you know, if you, if you were convinced by any of, any of Trump's claims, just why you really, really shouldn't be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and also, if you are somebody that doesn't have any self-respect and you did subject yourself to the debate last night, first off, I'm sorry— uh, second off, hopefully this will help you make some sense of it. And mm. also, hopefully this will add some ac- some proper nuanced views to that partisan hackery show that we saw. So, like, as soon as I finished watching it, like, all- after almost every single debate on my personal Facebook, I always, like, put in some type of, you know, debate breakdown uh, in which I try really hard to you know use some interesting nuanced takes on candidates Mm -hmm. last night i finished the debate and i was just like i got nothing for you sorry i just wrote that on my facebook i got nothing Mm. for you (laughs) (laughs) yeah like uh but upon further reflection i have more now but before that (laughs) michael Let's talk about something less depressing, the COVID numbers. Yeah, just uh, death and disease. Excellent. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I feel like uh, we've used that joke like 30 times now, but it's, it hasn't gotten old. Ex- yeah. I- at least I don't feel like it has. Yeah, and, and we run the show, so. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, worldwide, we've had 33.8 million cases up from 31.8 last week, which is a 6% increase. We've had a total of about 1 million deaths, which is up from 975,000 last week, or a 2.5% increase. And there are currently 7.7 million active cases in the world, which is a 3% increase over last week. In the U.S., we've had a total of 7.4 million cases, which is up from 7.1 last week, which is a 4% increase. So again, uh, as we've seen in the past few weeks, a slower increase than what we've seen worldwide. Uh, total deaths have hit 211,000, um, up 2% from last week. So again, a little bit slower of an increase than the, the world overall. In total, we have a total of 2.5 million active cases, which is about a 4% decrease from the week before. So we did it. Our active case growth went negative. Good. Finally. Yeah, but again, this is one week, not a trend yet. And it comes as at least 21 states have seen week-over-week increases in new cases. Mm. So, yeah, and experts are still forecasting that we could see a second wave as people relax restrictions, um, including some forecasts from the CDC that say that, you know, if 
if people uh, aren't strictly wearing masks and aren't social distancing, we could see another 200,000 deaths. So basically a doubling of our current level of death right now, which I think if we hit a total of 400,000 deaths, I think it'd be the second leading cause of death in the yeah. U.S. Yeah. And also keep in mind another thing to look at with those numbers uh, I know that I use references like this a lot, but I do think it's important to keep mentioning. 20% of global deaths have occurred in the United States, and we make up approximately 5% of the world. You know, I have to give a huge <laughs> shout out to the Perspectrum, big <laughs> pat on the back to us, because that is, um, because I guess Biden is listening to our show because he yeah. made that exact call out during the debate. Because... Yeah. Yeah, and we've been. This is something we've been trying to hammer home, home in our coverage for months now. That exactly, that, you know, it's we, a main indicator that we are behind. Like we cannot pretend in any possible way that the United States is not uniquely bad at COVID nineteen. I mean, yeah. again, people might make the argument that we have the highest number of deaths because we have a larger population. And while it is true that we are one of the more heavily populated countries in the world. If you do look at it proportionally, if you do break it down by proportion, we still make up only 5% of the world, but 20% of the deaths. That is terrible. That is yeah. an awful job. And I really wish that aspects of that had been hammered a little bit more. I did appreciate that Biden brought that up, but yeah, <laughs> that's probably one of the nicest things I'm going to say about Biden tonight. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I I have a I have probably have a couple more nice things to say, but partially I might, it's just I might have a few nice things. I think say, my expectations were really low. Yeah. So. So yeah. So let's talk about like how you were feeling, as you were like sitting down to watch the debate. Like, what were you thinking? What were you expecting? Um. So as I was sitting down to watch the debate, I was thinking, I really hope that I don't shit myself. <laughs> and. As I was watching the debate, I was thinking, oh, damn it, I just shit myself. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, uh, wow. What about you? How are you? <laughs> I'm, I must have said to Brie like four or five times how nervous I was as I was yeah. like setting up to take notes. And um, yeah, yeah, I was like, I was really, I was kind of, I had a lot of uncertainty, mostly from how I thought Biden would do. Yeah. Like, I think for me, Trump could only have taken kind of two tacts, and one was basically what he did, which was fact-free and very aggressive. And the other one, which I thought had been, would have been more effective, was actually if he had prepared instead yeah. of totally winging it yeah. and had actually had some facts that, you know, weren't totally made up. Yeah. Um, but the real wild card in my mind as I was sitting down to watch was Biden. Like, was he going to give a performance like he did in, you know, I think it was like the second to last debate where he like, he was great. Or was he going to give, I mean, great is, <clears throat> you know, a relative, yeah, fair time. enough, <laughs> relative, <laughs> definitely true. Or was he going to give just kind of a weak um, and confused kind of, you know, um, performance. And I think he did kind of the middle of those. I, I mean, I do, he wasn't as bad as I was, a, I was worried he would be, Yeah, but, he was still pretty bad. I mean, yes. let's be real. Yeah. Like, and look, look, I know that there are a lot of people that might be thinking, well, Nathan, you're just biased against Biden. You don't like Biden. You made that clear during the primary. You still won't shut up about how much you don't like Biden, even though he's your candidate. I, I, I get that. You know, I, 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 I acknowledge. Oh, that's fact. true. <laughs> <laughs> well, all of that is true to an extent. Yeah. Uh, I, I do. I do have my own personal biases against Biden. However, I will say that to an extent, I think I can be objective at this be, about this because I'm trying to compare the Biden that we saw last night with the Biden from the 2012 vice presidential debate. Now, mm -hmm. I often bring this up. In the 2012 vice presidential debate, Joe Biden ran in circles around Paul Ryan while Paul Ryan hopelessly punched himself in the testicles. Like, he was sharp. He knew that what he was doing. the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> like it was, he was sharp. He was solid. Like he dominated Paul Ryan. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, a lot of people 
chalk it up to, oh, well, the reason why he might not have seemed as sharp is because of a stutter. And that's true. Joe Biden does have a stutter. And, you know, we definitely should not be uh, bullying him or teasing him or, you know, trying to cast any doubt on his intelligence because of his stutter, which, yeah, again, course. is why I'm comparing Biden from 2012 to Biden yeah. now. He has slowed down, and we did see that last night. There were so many instances in which Trump made these made these ridiculous, horrific arguments that could have easily been addressed. Yeah. And Biden just like either ignored it or yeah. he got um, he got jumbled. He went from one topic to another. At, at one point, there was this weird moment where he said, like, they, they were talking about the Green New Deal. And Joe yeah. Biden oh said, gosh. you know, the Green New Deal will pay for itself. And then Trump was like, well, do you support the Green New Deal? And he was like, no. Yeah. It's like I support the Biden plan. And what the hell just happened? <laughs> yeah, that happened a number of times. And I think on, when he just kind of ignored Trump's jabs, periodically or crappy facts like yeah. i could interpret that as a strategy like i'm not yeah. like when trump is flinging lies um like one of those really impressive new nerf guns that has like a 50 round magazine and comes out like machine gun like it you would waste all of your time on his turf trying to refute them so i can see that as a strategy but even the times when he was trying to um make points or counter Trump, he would often get into these, he would often just like fail to stick the landing. He would either yeah. get con like confused or jumbled or would accidentally switch topics. Um, yeah, I, th yeah. I feel like, and, and we can talk more about this, but like, I feel like it, like people were talking about how Trump was like a bully throughout the, which the, he was the thing, which he totally was. But I feel like if, if he, just let it fly he would have had way more opportunity to be bullying another thing is that overall i thought that the substance of a lot of biden's arguments uh, yeah were really lacking like I, again yeah. I, I, one thing i would like to be clear i'm being tough on biden right now because you know i'm always tough on biden but to be clear i'm not like i'm comparing biden to an ideal politician. I'm not comparing mm -hmm. Biden to Trump when I criticize him in that debate. Yeah, yeah. Like, I voted for Biden. I voted for Biden too. I I've already voted for Biden, and yeah, you know, too. I last night just reinforced to me how important it was that I voted for Biden. Mm -hmm. But it is important to recognize that we wanted a candidate that was able to stand up to Trump. That was able to mm -hmm. be on a debate stage with Trump. And, you know, to an extent, not take the bait, but but even when they're not ta even when he wasn't taking the bait, he still was not sticking the points that he was trying to that he was trying to make. Like I was sitting there and I was thinking, God, I can't wait for the vice presidential debate. Yeah. The too. vice presidential debate. Pence versus There's Harris. There's only one of those. <laughs> yeah. Pence versus Harris. I, you know, I'm no fan of Harris and I despise Pence. But Harris at least is a very sharp debater. She's a very smart woman. And I was sitting there thinking, like, why does, why does Biden have to be the one running for president right now? I mean, mm -hmm. if you had to go with a moderate, why didn't you go with Harris or something? Yeah. Like, or even better, why didn't you just go with Bernie? <laughs> <laughs> I know, well, I know that's we unproductive can't bring, right now. We can't do that. I know that's unproductive right now. I know that's yeah. not productive. But oh my God, last night, yeah, like point after point after point after point after point that Trump was making was basically accusing Joe Biden of being Bernie Sanders. Sure, sure. And and again, this is something that I said over and over on the pod. If he's going to call you a bunch of crazy socialists, which was the same point that Buttigieg made at one point, mm -hmm. then like just fight for what you want to fight for because they're going to straw man you regardless. Yeah, like it felt like there were there were so many instances of Donald Trump being like, "Oh well, uh, uh, Joe Biden, he's in favor of this super popular position," and Joe mm -hmm. Biden's like, "No, I am not in favor of that super popular <laughs> position." Like he did that with Medicare for all. He did that with the Green New Deal. Like. Yeah. But I think, I think, I mean, if you're thinking about like 
swing voters who aren't the people that are just going to take Trump's um, anti-socialism rhetoric against Joe Biden at face value. Like none of Trump's silly claims about Biden being a socialist landed at all. It was just like so clear that he was he was trying to debate against um, like, quote, like radical. Yeah progressive democrats and not against biden because he even kept going back to like well you're just gonna lose your progressives if you say that blah 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 yeah. and it was like oh my god <laughs> yeah that Can't pissed me that. off so much when he said that when when uh, trump kept saying that because i mean it's like he has this idea in his head that progressives don't already know that biden's a corporate centrist it's like mm. we know that it's not like we're tuning into the debate right now and we hear, oh, my God, Joe Biden is not in favor of Medicare for all. I had no idea. Oh, I'm not going to vote for him anymore. It's like we, knew that. we already knew <laughs> yeah. that. We've yeah. been saying anybody that. that is that passionate about Medicare for all to make it their issue. Already yeah. Knows. Um, so I do want to take a bit of a step back. I know we kind of like launched right into yeah, talking know. about some of the. <laughs> well, we did of kind our... of decide that this episode was kind of kind of just be you know, see where it takes us, but yeah, 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 but, yeah. I, but let's, let's, you know, let's try to organize it a bit more. Yeah, definitely. So I want to kind of start off by, in, in case you did miss the debate, kind of like talking through a little bit of what the format was like. Um, and some of the comparisons between, um, like just basic fact check numbers on the two of them, comparisons of how much time they spoke and also talk a little bit about what the polls are sitting like and, and why this debate actually is like a really important thing, like why I was sitting there nervous that this could change the whole trajectory of our country before watching this. Yeah. So first of all, the debate was moderated by Chris Wallace, who's a Fox News anchor, um, who I actually thought did a better than than a better job than he could have done. Like I actually thought he did pretty well. Yeah. He was I, in a hard spot. He was okay. In his favor, I will say that he definitely was in a hard spot. Um, Trump did end up going off the rails worse than he did in 2000 uh, in 2016. Mm -hmm. One thing I will say, so I remember watching the debate that Chris Wallace moderated in 2016 between Trump mm -hmm. and Hillary Clinton. And I remember watching that debate thinking, wow, that is the best debate moderator I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. Like... His moderation of the 2016 debate between Trump and Hillary, that was the best moderation I'd ever seen. That was not last night. Like, yeah, yeah. so I guess my issue was, I understand what you're saying. And like, I don't know how many other moderators could have done it much better, mm -hmm. but I was comparing his ability to moderate the debate in 2016 to his ability to do it uh, this year. Mm -hmm. And... Oh my God, I was so disappointed. <laughs> even the moderators are going downhill. <laughs> yeah, even the moderators are going downhill. Like, I, I mean, you know, at, at several points, my dad looked at me while we were watching the debate and he was just like, So you still love Chris Wallace as a debate moderator? And I was like, Well, I, you know, I've been wrong before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, and so, the debate was broken up into six segments, which were 15 minutes each. And Chris Wallace selected all the topics and all of the questions. And the topics were um, focusing on Trump and Biden's record, focusing on the Supreme Court, on COVID-19, the economy, um, focusing on race and violence in our cities, and the integrity of the election. When I first saw this, I was actually like relatively worried because it was all very top of mind kind of, you know, in the news subjects. Yeah. But very few big, um, you know, focuses on key policy issues. And so I was kind of worried that we were, we were going to get basically what we got in a lot of ways, which was yeah. Trump only able to hold his own because he can talk about whatever's in front of his face. And... Yeah and not really getting a lot of substance on um, their policies. Now it turned out that that was kind of the least of our worries, but yeah, <laughs> but I feel like, I feel like they did not yeah. do themselves any favors with those as like all of the headline topics though. At yeah. the same time, I don't know how you don't talk about those specific things. Well, I, so the topic selection for me was less um, 
like that was less of a problem. I think that the topic selection made sense. I mean, I, I'm hoping that there will be more talk about foreign policy in future debates. Mm -hmm. Uh, not just because I know that that's where Biden's going to shine a lot more and Trump's going to come off more like an idiot. Um, but also because that's what the president has the most power over. Yeah. Like, you know, one of the things that uh, I often talk about with our friend Chris is the fact that there's often this melding between the executive branch and the legislative branch. Mm -hmm. um, now, to an extent, I think, like, I don't have as much of a problem with that as, as Chris does, but what he is, but what, what the point that that does make is the fact that uh, the president's power over legislation is nothing without a legislature that is in line with them. Yeah. However, when it comes to foreign policy, it's a lot different. Because the president has significantly more power over the military, over mm -hmm. negotiations, over appointing ambassadors, diplomacy, all of that. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, sometimes it is kind of problematic that when we vote for the president, one of the first things that we think about usually are domestic issues, which we really should be focusing a lot more on on foreign issues, foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really strong point. That's a great point. Yeah, I feel like we always attribute um, like policy and policy records to presidents and yeah. they play a role. They can help set a direction and a list of priorities, which they can share with the Senate, but yeah. ultimately it's not necessarily up to them. Yeah. Which is, which I thought was an interesting point about like Trump trying to make the claim that, that um, you know, the Obama Biden presidency was like weak and ineffectual. And it was like, well, they spent a lot of time with um, a Republican Senate. And yeah. so there's not, you know, there's only so much you can do. Well, not just a Republic. I mean, they only, they only had a Republican Senate for the last two years of their, uh, of their presidency. It was, yeah, yeah. it was more so the house, which they lost after two years mm -hmm. of being in office. Uh, which basically blocked any chance of legislative gains. Um, but then the Senate, of course, you know, blocked, uh, you know, judge appointment ships, which, yeah. by the way, <laughs> I know, let's talk I about know. that for a second. Yeah. So Trump goes off on the rails during the debate about how the Obama Biden administration left a ton of open seats for judges, for federal mm -hmm. judges. Yeah. And that is such a misleading yeah. Well, headline. Yeah, he like, used it to say that any president or any administration that leaves that many open seats must be bad. Yeah, which is, <laughs> like... Like, it doesn't take... You don't even have to double-click. You, yeah. you can right-click on that, and you'll see that that is a totally um, erroneous claim because yeah. the fact is that Mitch McConnell... And the Republican Senate are the people that held up all of those appointments. Yeah, because they're the ones that had power over uh, whether or not there were going to be hearings held uh, during the last two years of Obama's presidency. Mm -hmm. So the reason why there were so many appointment ships open was not because of incompetence on the on the uh, the part of the Obama administration. It was because of dirty politics on the part of Mitch McConnell. Now, mm -hmm. look. Trump can still say, like, if, you know, if he wanted something to brag about, he could say, look at all these judges I've appointed. Thanks, Mitch. Like, that would be... You know, <laughs> I've united be the government. <laughs> and, yeah, well, and, and if you're somebody, if you are conservative, then that, that would be appealing. It's to a you. huge win, yeah. Yeah, it's a huge win. I mean, if you're a conservative, then, you know, Mitch McConnell's probably one of the most effective leaders that you could ever have. Uh, but... To pretend that that somehow has to do with incompetence on the uh, it, on the Obama administration is just like it's fallacious at best and intentionally maliciously misleading at worst. Yeah, I'd say it's pretty safe to call that misleading. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> intentionally misleading. Um, and and yeah, so that so the discussion of the courts kind of brings me to like the first question in the debate, which was <clears throat> the first section was focused on the Supreme Court. And, um, you know, Trump was asked if he was going to like go ahead and, and make a nomination and whether he thought that was the right thing to do. And, you know, he made the 
clear and obvious point that it is the right of the president and the obligation of the president to nominate someone to the Supreme Court when there's a vacancy. It's just how it works. And I thought I thought Biden like totally screwed the pooch on oh, this. Oh God, yes. It he was definitely the exact wrong argument. It was he exactly the, exact the wrong, wrong argument. argument. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because and so Trump basically said, you know, politics are dirty and the Dem- Democrats are just as dirty if they had had the opportunity in 2016 to block a Republican nomination, they would have. So, you know, screw you guys. Um, but again, he's like totally correct in his central claim that he has the ability to nominate um, this justice. And and Biden comes back and makes the exact same point that Mitch McConnell made yeah. in 2016, which is like, we should wait and let the voters decide. And it yeah. was like, Instead of like hammering home a point about hypocrisy and eroding norms and being yeah. divisive and hurting our politics, he just like was a hypocrite. I mean, yeah, he was a total, total hypocrite, and yeah. in in the wrong from a um, uh, historical and you know policy perspective. Now, Trump was a hypocrite too because you know in 2016 he made the same damn argument. Sure. Yeah. Um, no, you're you're absolutely right, and. Um, but even he came off as like being more yeah. honest and he even, because he, he was like, well, the Democrats legs, just would He even had more legs to stand on because like, yeah. even though he was making that argument, he was not in an official position back then. Yeah. 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 So and he was honestly even you know, owning that it was a, a, a switch. It was yeah. like, huh, they switched, but Democrats would have too. So whatever. Yeah. And, and look like the argument that Biden should have made right there again, mm-hmm. like you said, is that back then, the Republicans established a precedent based on a principle that they claimed to believe in. And Mm. now, they're completely throwing that precedent out, and the only reason they're giving is partisan reasons. Yeah. Clearly, they're being divisive, and they're not satisfying their own own standards. Mm -hmm. They're hypocrites. They have no principles. Yeah. So, you know, that's and that's a really strong argument and one that actually is supported by the facts. Yeah. But God, that was exactly the wrong argument to use. Yeah, I completely agree. But one thing that like I think everybody noticed was how much they were like talking over each other the whole time, which is funny because like the the amount of time they spoke was pretty close to equal, even though Trump seemed to be like talking a bunch. Trump spoke for like 39 minutes and, and Biden spoke for 37. But I don't know how much of that is just talking at the same time. Yeah. I, so I don't think that it's fair for anybody to say that they were talking over each other. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, That was very one-sided. Like, Yeah, I think that's With true. Biden, like yeah. every now and then he would do it. But like when Chris Wallace would like be you know, be like okay let let him talk Biden would be like okay sorry yo know. yep and yeah. he would take us and he'd take a step back uh, of course when Trump would do it he would just keep doing it and keep doing it keep doing it damn the yeah. rules like yeah, I'm he here to be like, an asshole argue with That's the moderator argue oh my god it was yeah. horrible it was which cringy. like you know the the part where Trump was like oh I guess I'm ta- I guess I'm uh, debating against two people. Yeah, it's like, well, no, no, you're you're debating against reality. Like you, you no. got. <laughs> <laughs> I totally and like that's what kept coming home to me is like, like even though like Biden was not doing an incredible job making his points and positions, like so, the facts were all on his side, and they so, were. And, Any and, time you like going through the fact checks and going and even like referring to what Wallace like said in his in his questions, it was all like, well. This is all on the side of Biden in this debate. Yeah. And, and, you know, and that is an important point to make. So one of the things that we do need to ask ourselves is like delivery versus accuracy. Yeah. Totally. I mean, if it were completely a delivery debate, if it were about delivery, then obviously, you know, Trump's the winner. I mean, mm-hmm. hands down, Trump's the winner. Uh, but if we make it about substance, if we make it about facts, and if people at least have the ability to know when Trump was bullshitting, yeah, then you know Biden's the clear winner because yeah. Biden, like you know, every now and then he would make a statement that might have been might have been a little half true, might have been a little misleading, but for the most part, mm-hmm. uh, he was actually focusing on the facts. In fact, yeah. there were there were a few instances in which he would say something that I would think, okay, there's no way that's true. 
There's mm -hmm. absolutely no way that's true. Uh, like there is one claim that uh, Joe Biden made at one point where he said that uh, one in 1,000 yeah. uh, black Americans have died of COVID. And when I heard that, I was like, there's, there's no way that's true. There's yeah, I absolutely the same thing. no way that's true. Uh, turns out um, there actually is good evidence to suggest that. So, yeah, which is uh, just staggering. There was this study done by uh, the research arm of American Public Media um, that found that one in 1,020 black Americans have died of the coronavirus. And this is based off of death rate data collected from uh, every state in the union, including Washington, D.C. Wow. That was, that was staggering. I had no idea that things were at that level. And mm -hmm. I think bringing that to our attention was, was, a very, was definitely a very strong point in favor of Joe Biden. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think, I think he had a few points about COVID. I think that was one of the points about COVID that he landed most strongly. He, he was, he tried to make a number of arguments that like Trump in his failure to address COVID has failed in a lot of ways, which I think sometimes he made less effectively. Like he repeatedly said that like Trump ruined the economy. And when I first heard that, I was like, no, COVID ruined the economy. And but he didn't make the connection between Trump ruined the economy because he failed to uh, adequately address COVID well, until like the very end when he was like, you know, you can't fix the economy until you fix COVID. Yeah, well, that's an important point. You can't fix the economy until you fix COVID. But another important point that never seems to get brought up in any of these debates, especially when it's, you know, a more moderate uh, Democrat mm -hmm. is we just accept the idea that the economy was good prior to yeah. the pandemic. And mm -hmm. you can make that argument based off GDP numbers, mm -hmm. but you can't make that argument based on the deficit. Yeah. And sure. even, and even then, you know, you can admit, you can make that argument based on the stock market. But yeah. what I think is the most important measure, which never gets brought up is wages. Yeah, because totally. the stock market is much more of a measure of how the most well-off Americans are doing. Mm -hmm. But wages have not kept up with inflation over the last two decades. And look, maybe that's a point that Biden can't make because it was like that under Obama, too. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can argue that the stock market was good under Obama. You can argue that the deficit was under was uh, that people got a, got control over the deficit under Obama. You can argue that uh, GDP growth was pretty high under Obama, but mm -hmm. wages were stagnant under him as well. Yeah. And that's not a point that we bring up. Yeah. No, that's that's I think that's totally true. It's totally true. And I mean, maybe from a political argument perspective, it's more important for Biden to argue that he and Obama made the economy great. But honestly, like, I feel like you could probably make the argument that, you know, we haven't fixed everything in the past, but we're going yeah. to. Like he made that point about about racial inequality. And he said, and we have never walked away from trying to quite require equ equity for everyone, equality for the whole of America. But we've never accomplished it. But we've never walked away from it like he has done. I feel like you can easily make that point about yeah. like jobs as well. Like we like, you know, we haven't fixed wages like we haven't been able to accomplish that yet. We're going to. Yeah. And, you know, and I think that last night would have been a good opportunity to point that out. And that's one of the issues that Joe Biden has is there are certain positions in which he seems to be. Uh, he, he has on his website, like, you know, a $15 an hour minimum wage. Yeah. But he didn't mention that last night. Yeah, I know. And why? Yeah. That is overwhelmingly popular. That is a substantive policy. And, you know, again, you're not going to turn off much of the country by fighting for a $15 an hour minimum wage. But by not talking about it, you're going to turn off a lot of people in your base. And now it's time for one of our more positive segments, Tips for Good. So, Nathan, why do we do Tips for Good? Because I got tears in my heart, blood in my mind, and pain in my prostate. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, and, and I assume to make the world a better place, right? Oh, yeah, that too. In, that too including yeah. those things. Yeah, including those things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nathan, what is our tip for good this week? Well, Michael, our tip for good this week is specifically a more practical tip. It's about making sure that you are careful with mail-in ballots, specifically mm. how you fill out mail-in ballots. So one of the things that Michael and I have talked about on the pod a little bit before is the fact that there is actually a concern about mail-in ballots, but it's exactly the opposite of what Trump says it is. It's not the potential for fraud because there's a lack of security. Instead, it's the potential for ballots to just be rejected because there's too much security. Yeah. So there are various reasons in which a ballot could just be thrown out. I mean, mm -hmm. there is a there is a report that came out uh, about the the primary election that said that what was it like two hundred thousand ballots had just been rejected during the primary. Was mm -hmm. was was that it? Two hundred thousand. I thought it was actually five hundred. I saw in one. It headline. might have been five hundred. Yeah. So like, but it's a ton. Yeah. Either way. Exactly, and that's enough to tip an election. Easy. So, yeah. if you are filling out mail in ballots, be careful. Yeah. Make sure that you know you, you write your name where it needs to. Make sure that you're very careful with your handwriting. Make sure that if you are filling in bubbles, that you fill them in all the way, that you're not messy with it. Yeah. Follow the instructions absolutely to the letter, you know. And we would tell you exactly how to do it, but it depends on where you are. Yeah. So, you know, if you have a question, make sure to be thorough in your in your research trying to answer it. Um, and, and for the most part, it's a pretty straightforward process. So, yeah. but even down to like using the right envelope and making sure in Virginia, we have two envelopes. There's an, there's an envelope with your ballot in it that, uh, you write your name on or that you don't write your name on, excuse me, but you do sign. Um, and then there's an envelope, um, on the, you know, an outside envelope with your return address and the address of your polling station. Uh, you have to use both or your ballot could get rejected. Yeah. So, yeah. And this again, election is too important to risk that. Definitely. Yeah. So just follow the instructions, do the thing that your dad never do and read the, read the instructions and follow them. <laughs> <laughs> do the thing that my dad never does? My dad always read the instructions. He's the only person that I know That's that reads awesome. the instructions. <laughs> I, I read every instruction on every single thing I get, hands down. <laughs> I'm the only person I know that does it. <laughs> well, now you know too. Now dad. too. Yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> And that's, and tips, that's for tips for good. So to start out this next section, talking about the debate, um, you know, I want to talk. I want to talk a little bit about um, how I coped with the debate after you know it ended. So so partially it was you know I watched some Archer, tried to watch some <laughs> Rick and Morty, but we ran out of that apparently, which was really sad. Two sad yeah. things in one night. But then, then I decided to turn to music, which is always solace for me. And I actually wrote a song mm. about the debate um, that I wanted to play for you guys. So, uh, yeah, so here it goes. We are so fucked. <laughs> so, 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 so fucked. And that's it. I like it. It's catchy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know I don't think I've ever had a song <laughs> more perfectly encapsulate my feelings on a subject than you know since since I listened to the song End of the World as We Know It uh, after <laughs> Trump got elected in 2016 Fair enough. Fair enough. Man, it's a, it's a, it's a, a special league of people to be in, <laughs> of artists and musicians. Yeah. All right. So before we get more into the debate, Michael, let's talk a little bit about why is this debate important? Yeah. So, so this debate is important because, believe it or not, there are still people that aren't sure who they're going to vote for or whether they're going to vote. So... Like, you know, what they see on the stage actually might inform 
the outcome of the election and and how they they pick. Now, you may be thinking, like, how is that possible? Like, certainly there aren't people that think there's an equivalency between the two candidates. But in all the noise, like, if you don't if you don't reject some of Trump's more off color um, characteristics outright, and you're really nervous about government spending and some of the more con- traditional conservative issues that cause you to re- shy away from Democrats, you might be pretty tempted to stay at home or or vote third party or you know even vote for Trump. So so currently there are six percent of voters who are still undecided according to an NBC poll. Um, and depending on the poll, this varies from about 3 to 11% of voters. So definitely enough to tip an election, you know, obviously depending on where those voters are. Yeah. And if you look at the electoral college, um, it becomes even more of a question. So currently, um, according to the Financial Times, there are 134 electoral votes that are still in uh, like a toss-up category from states that are not, it's not obvious where they'll lean. So so apparently Biden, um, who is, is, when you take a national average of polling, leading Trump by just 6.6%. But so apparently he's got um, in the solid or leaning Biden category, 279 electoral votes. So that's only nine more than, than the number he'll need to win. Um, now, on the other side, Trump only has 125 that are solidly or leaning his direction. But again, that leaves 134 votes that are still toss-up. And so that 6 to 11% of voters translates to, you know, an only like nine vote safety margin for Biden that, you know, could really could really go the other way. Like we still have plenty yeah. of electoral votes that um you know, that are up for grabs. And let's not forget about the fact that if Trump gets his way on the Supreme Court, which he probably will, yep. uh, if the election is close, he's almost so- certainly not going to accept the results mm-hmm. and try to take it to the Supreme Court, and we could have another Bush v. v- Gore situation, and yeah. that would be terrible. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, we've talked about how horrible that would be for our democracy. And, you know, uh, during the debate, Biden specifically said that, like, you know, whatever the um, outcome of the votes says will be the outcome, and he'll just have to accept it. But the fact is that, you know, depending on how a case is put together and winds through the court, if it ends up in front of the Supreme Court, it's not just a matter of whatever the votes say. So, and that's scary. Yeah, and that's why that's why like this debate and and how it's perceived matter a whole ton. And so yeah. we won't be able to see kind of how that plays out in the polls for another few days. And we have two more presidential debates after this. But uh yeah. You know, especially considering during the debate when they went to both candidates and asked that question, mm-hmm. instead of Trump saying, "Yes, I will" tell my uh i'll tell my supporters if we don't have the results on election night stand by don't celebrate it until it has been independently verified Mm. instead of saying that he said i encourage my supporters to go into polls and and watch people Mm -hmm. that is terrifying and illegal in a lot of places like you like random people can't just go into polling places and and observe the voters yeah like yeah <laughs> so like the attorney general of nevada came out and said if people if people try to do that they will be prosecuted yeah now to be clear there's a difference between that and having campaign officials present while the vote's being tallied totally. like they usually do that they usually have yeah. campaign officials from both campaigns observing while the votes are being counted to make sure that there's no you know tomfoolery um like that that's very common but that's different from sending people into polls to watch people vote yeah there are specific poll watchers and it again it varies state by state but like you qualify to be a person that's in the room kind of observing to make sure sure things are going fine and and there when the ballots are counted that's Yeah. yeah that's totally different from you know you're not even allowed to like post up outside and you know 
looks scary because that's voter intimidation. Yeah. And that's illegal. Yeah, I thought I thought this was one of the places where like the contrast between the two of them could not have been more clear. Really stark. Yeah, yeah, totally. It was like Biden was a, an American politician. Votes decide elections and we believe in our system of democracy and in our elections. And Trump basically came out and said like he is expecting this election not to be decided by voting, but rather by the courts. Yeah. Absolutely. Um another important note uh, another important thing that Trump decided not to uh, condemn or promise, um, he didn't condemn white supremacy. Yeah. That part was, like, that part was chilling. So How has he point, not figured this out, that that's not cool? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> at one point, he uh, was asked by Chris Wallace to condemn... Uh, white supremacist groups, you know, specifically, specifically, uh, he was talking about groups like the Proud Boys. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at first Trump, it, it looked like Trump was going to go ahead and do it. He said, yeah, of course, I'll do whatever, you know, I'll, I'll condemn whatever. And Biden and Wallace were like, okay, go ahead, do it. Yeah. You know, condemn them. He's like, all right, who do you want me to condemn? It's like, all right, white supremacists, you know, like the Proud Boys. He's like, all right, Proud Boys, stand back and stand by. And I was like, what the I fuck know. did he I just know. say? Oh my God! I know. I was totally stunned. Absolutely. Did he stunned. just tell white supremacists to stand by? And yeah. you know. And I, then he followed it up by saying, "But I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left because this is not a right wing problem. This is a left wing problem." Basically, which, he's saying, "Like I'll ask them to stand by, but hey, wink, wink, nod, nod. Maybe you have to do something about Antifa." Yeah, which Biden correctly then said, which citing Trump's own FBI director, mm -hmm. that Antifa is not an official organization. It's yeah. just an idea. Now, you can condemn people that commit violence who consider themselves a part of Antifa, because, again, totally. it's not it's more a group of autonomous groups that don't have one centralized organization. You mm -hmm. can condemn that. And, you know, Biden has. We have as well. But. It's not an organization. So to pretend that there is an organized effort by leftist groups to commit terrorist acts is just not accurate. Mm -hmm. And Trump's own FBI director has confirmed that. And when, yeah. when Biden pointed that out, Trump was just like, well, he's wrong. You know, the FBI director, my FBI director, he's just wrong. Yeah. Which he kept saying about so many of the people in his own administration. Yeah. Like, <laughs> they're, just, they're just wrong. The, uh, another point on... on race that I wanted to pick up on because I thought it was a bit more subtle, but like really, really telling. Um, yeah. So, so he was asked by Wallace um, why he had ended racial sensitivity training um, in the government. Oh God. So, yeah. And his, and his, so I'll read his response and then, and Wallace's follow up and then, and then the beginning of his, of his, the comment that really drove home, like truly the way he thinks and his, his, um, his his racism. Like, even if he's not condemning white supremacists, maybe you can argue, like, well, he's about free speech and the Second Amendment and, and white supremacists love those. But, like, this is, yeah, this is, like, the quiet part out loud. So he said, quote, I ended it because it's racist. I ended it because a lot of people were complaining that they were asked to do things that were absolutely insane. That, that it was a radical revolution that was taking place in our military, in our schools, all over the place. And you know it, and so does everybody else, and he would know it. And Wallace said, what is radical? What is radical about racial sensitivity training? And Trump responded, and this is the part, if you were a certain person, you had no status in life, it's a sort of reversal. Reverse racism, basically. Like, basically, he's saying... I think I, what what how I hear that is that he's not he's he's is that he's totally acknowledging that black people in the United States are considered to have no status in life but he's rejecting and and he wants to fight against the idea that that should be an experience that white people have See that I that is not how I interpreted that uh, I interpreted that as him basically saying that white people have no status, like when it comes to um, when it comes to racial sensitivity training, because we don't talk about 
racial sensitivity when it comes to white people because there's no institutionalized racism against white people. But I took it as that and him saying it's in the reverse. I took that as him saying that it's reverse racism. Mm. Maybe maybe my interpretation was a lot more like was giving him a lot more credit than yours was. Though. If he had said if he had said something about like, you know, in those conversations, if you were a certain person, you know, you had no status. Like that would be one thing. But he said if you're a certain person, you had no status in life. In life. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I was just I, I thought I thought that was like really dog whistly to me. Huh. I mean, I thought it was dog whistly too, but I think that we got different interpretations from that. But that's that's another issue. Trump is a bad communicator. Yeah. Like you, you know, some people could argue that maybe the, you know, the whole stand back, stand by, that maybe mm-hmm. that was just like a slip of the tongue. Or, yeah. You know, I mean, but I think didn't that at it. best, <laughs> I think that at best it was a Freudian slip. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Well, I think that's what this was too. Like, <laughs> it was like, whoops. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think that he's just, I mean, you know, part of it is he is just a bad communicator. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, which means that when it comes to, he can't even hammer home a message that really matters. Like, yeah, don't be a white supremacist or yeah. wear a mask. It's the everything he said is double speak. It's yeah. all double speak. Yeah, well, it's because he hates being pressured into doing things that he doesn't want to do, and he mm-hmm. doesn't want to condemn white supremacists. Yeah, I mean. And the reason for that is not necessarily because he believe he agrees with them on every issue. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not going to say that he's on the same level as like Richard Spencer or David Duke. I'm not going to say that. Yeah. But he knows that people like Richard Spencer and uh, David Duke, he knows they like him. Yeah. And because he knows they like him, he doesn't want to say anything bad about him, them. Mm-hmm. You know, again, maybe it's not because he agrees with their white supremacy, but... He doesn't mind it because mm-hmm. they like him in the process. Yeah. Yeah, that's totally that's totally true. And like I don't understand how he is trying to make the argument that Democrats are like political hacks because yeah. he's totally just pandering to anybody that will throw him a vote. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of Democrats are political hacks, but not nearly on the same level as Trump. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, Um, Like, there's this other really weird part where uh, they were were asked about race. So Trump and Biden were both asked about race. Mm -hmm. And Trump was asked why Biden was the wrong person to tackle race. And he started his point by saying Biden did the crime bill. Biden yeah. did the 1994 crime bill, and he called uh, black people super predators back then. Which, by the way, he was actually uh, he was actually mistaking Biden for Hillary Clinton. That was a statement made by Hillary Clinton, mm. um, which was actually made a big deal in 2016. And you know, as it as it should have been, it was a very problematic thing for her to have said. She wasn't necessarily directly talking about black people, but it was that's who she was talking about. Um, yeah. And again, but, being a good communicator and having points that like are not yeah. mistaken for that matters. Yeah. Um, but you know, that aside, Trump was rightfully criticizing Biden for the crime bill, mm-hmm. which was an abysmal failure, which Trump, you know, he rightfully took some credit for the first step act, mm-hmm. which, you know, there've been reports that behind closed doors, Uh, Trump is kind of uh, feeling like pissed off about having to do the First Step Act because it didn't win him much African-American support. There's some reports that where he's basically been like, well, why did I do that? They still don't support me. (laughs) It's like, well, you know, you did that because it was the right thing to do. But like but even if we brush that aside, let's assume that that's fake news. It's probably not. But let's assume that it is. Let's assume that's not true. He rightfully took credit for the First Step Act. And, you know, I will. I will always say whenever anybody asks me to say something nice about Donald Trump, that will be what I will say, the First Step Act. But then at the end of the point, Trump basically said that Joe Biden is against law and order. Yeah. That he's against law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And it was like, how do you, how do you in the same point say that Joe Biden 
did the crime bill, so therefore he's too tough on crime, and then ends that with saying, but he doesn't care about law and order. So he's simultaneously too hard on crime and too soft on crime. And he didn't see any contradiction there? Yeah. I mean, first off, Joe Biden repeatedly has talked about the importance of law and order. One thing I thought was kind of funny was Trump said, okay, go ahead and say law and order. And he was like, yeah, I believe in law and order, but we need to have justice. Yeah. And Trump was like, see, see, <laughs> see, he, he say didn't it. say law and order. He didn't say law and order. It's like, he just said that. He just said He's law He's like, and but order. you got me on a, on a commit to condemning something. I want to get you on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like no no yeah I, I believe in law and order but i also believe in justice which i i actually thought that was a really good line on yeah. biden's part yeah like i thought that that was a really good line of you know maintaining that like of course you know of course it's not true that leftists even ones that talk about defunding the police want there to be like a lawless america but yeah. i think he did a good job with that statement of you know sort of doing a nod to the people that are concerned about law and order, but also a nod to the people that are concerned about justice. Yeah. Yeah. I think that totally makes sense. I thought it was a, another example of Trump trying to pretend that Biden is this crazy progressive radical and trying yeah. to argue against that. And it, again, just like totally falling on its face um, and acting as if the left doesn't already know that, <laughs> that yeah. he's not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Um, and only a few lines later, I thought Biden made a pretty effective counterpoint um, about Trump's claim to be this law and order president, because really, he's just a fascist president. He's not <laughs> not yeah. really in support of law and order um, and or, nor justice. But uh, and Biden said, and I'm not totally opposed to defending the police officers. Matter of fact, police, local police, they only want defunding in his budget calls for a four hundred million dollar cut in law enforcement assistance. They need more assistance. They need help when they show up for a 911 call to have someone with him as a psychologist or psychiatrist to keep them from having to use force and be able to talk people down. It was like a very, well, yeah. to the point, to the degree that, you know, he was able to put all the words in the right order. It was a pretty succinct summation of, yeah. of yeah. why definitely, it's not about defunding the police. It's about getting the right resources out there. There's definitely a little bit of mix up in like the way he said it. Um, yeah. but, but, but yeah, the substance of what he was saying, I think was good. And it was, it was a nod to the defund the police crowd, mm -hmm. uh, because he is emphasizing the importance of like expanding resources on things that go beyond just a police officer showing up with a gun, um, while also kind of, you know, doing a nod to people that disagree with that. And look, I, you know, I've talked about how the substance behind defund the police is definitely something that I do agree with. Mm -hmm. um, but, and polls have repeatedly shown this, uh, that's not a very popular slogan. Yeah. Like among most of the country, that is not a popular slogan. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, that's something that even Bernie Sanders hasn't embraced yet. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, I think that that was probably a better strategy in the mm -hmm. end. Yeah, I agree. To your point about like how, like how the point got kind of jumbled, I thought that was kind of a theme for Biden throughout most of the debate. It was yeah. like he had a lot of. It was so clear that he had been coached very well, and he had a lot of good points, and that his coaches knew what they were working with, yeah. um, because you know he usually got most of the words into the point he was trying to make. Which he is usually got them bar. in like 80, 70 to 80% in the right order, such that someone who is fact checking him, someone who's looking into it, like connecting the dots a little bit more than he was, would know what he was trying to say. Yeah. And so like, I think we all kind of did a little bit mentally, or as we listened to him to like, help him out <laughs> in a way, because yeah. it was like, you know, you just had to sometimes fill in the gaps, kind of like you're talking to your to your grandparent, and maybe they're not yeah. making the most sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And on that point as well, like I thought, I thought that his strategy of when he got confused and frustrated of going back to basics and just kind of making the point directly to the American people that he had most prepared connected to that topic like he would just look straight into the camera and say something specific that he had prepared for and kind of yeah. reset himself 
and I thought it was actually like, I thought those were the moments when, yes, he seemed a little bit coached, but he made the most sense. He made the best arguments for himself. And, you know, Michael, I, I, I do agree with most of what you just said, but I feel like that is setting the bar it so It is very low. low. But unfortunately, the bars we're dealing with are Trump and Biden. And I know. So. I know. But God, that is I such know. a low bar. It's like, wow, he did a really good job of like, I mean, 80% of the time, his sentences mostly made sense. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. No, no. I know. Yeah, like, I know I just, exactly I just, how much I just, silver lining I was adding. On I know. I, I just, I hope you realize that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm no dummy. I, I definitely <laughs> realize that. So now, in place of an asshat, we're doing um, one of our favorite segments that so rarely comes along. We're going to give out a D-Bag Award. Yep. And so, for those of you that may not know, the D-Bag Award stands for Dershowitz Bag because he was one of the first people to originally make an argument so heinous and ridiculous that it had to have an award. Yep. We can never forget the time that he stood in front of the house and made the argument that the reason why Trump did not deserve to get impeached is because he believed that his reelection was necessary for the national security of the country. So therefore it doesn't matter if he did anything illegal. Hmm. God, <laughs> A callback to simpler times. I wish. <laughs> so who is our honorary winner of the D-Bag Award on this fine week? Well, this week we have a group of lawyers from Fox News specifically defending Mr. Tucker Carlson in a defamation lawsuit. Ah, who, who did he defame? So he defamed or, you know, allegedly defamed Karen McDougal. Um, who he referred to as extorting um, the president. And so she sued him for defamation, claiming that he had made a statement of fact that was false and therefore um, defamed her. And in response to that, their lawyers basically claimed that, um, no, in fact, the statements were not statements of fact. Um, and so they had to dismiss the case. And in response, um, the judge, who actually agreed to dismiss the case, um, said that the Fox News lawyers persuasively argued that Mr. Carlson's reputation um, means that, quote, any reasonable viewer arrives with an appropriate amount of skepticism about the statements he makes. Basically, they claimed <laughs> that you just can't believe the facts that he appears to be stating, and because they're so unbelievable, any reasonable viewer wouldn't take him seriously. So basically, uh, Carlson's own lawyers got him off a defamation suit by arguing that he is such an unreliable source, and it takes a special kind of idiot to take him seriously to the point where he couldn't possibly commit defamation. Because no one reasonable could possibly take him seriously. <laughs> and the best part is a judge agreed. <laughs> like, I'm not even I'm not even upset that he got out of the the defamation case. I know. Like, <laughs> like well, now it's on the record. No one yeah, should believe Tucker it is, Carlson. It is on the record, you know, Tucker Carlson has been declared by a judge to be a completely abysmal source of news. Yeah. And information. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes you accidentally say what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't even think it was ac accidental. Like, the reason why this is a D-Bag Award is because it's, like, it might have been effective for the specific case, but, I mean, God, that as an argument in defense of Tucker Carlson is just so self-defeating. Yeah. I and, totally agree. And hilarious. Yeah, when I first saw that, I sent that to Michael, and God, we we we, we lost at that it for so long. <laughs> it's so rare when you get a perfect D bag award. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, hearty congratulations to uh, Tucker Carlson's team of pro lawyers for receiving our D bag award.
And so we will finish up our episode by just some final thoughts on this travesty that many of us observed. And hopefully if you're listening to this, you didn't have to, and you just got to hear our reactions to it. Yeah. Um, so Nathan, yeah. What, what are your kind of final thoughts? So while I was watching it, the communication professor in me <laughs> was in physical pain. Like one of the first texts that I sent Michael while I was watching was I literally feel sick to my stomach right now. Like, and yeah. I'm, I, I, not figuratively, I actually felt pain in my stomach while I was watching it. Honestly, both candidates did not do well. Um, but again, the bar is so low that if we're focusing purely on substance, which that's what I hope people are focusing on when they're watching it. I hope people are focusing on substance. Obviously Joe Biden's the winner. Yeah. Like, Hands down, no question. Substantively, he he's the only person that talked about real issues. Yeah, you know he's the only person that talked about, um, like he's the only person that was even remotely factual mm -hmm. uh, about yeah. most of his statements. I mean, Trump was lying his ass off the whole night, mm -hmm. and but at the same time, it just it just reminds me how disappointing. It is that he's our nominee mm -hmm. because we had a lot of candidates in the Democratic primary that would have done so much better on a debate stage against Trump. Not yeah. all of which are candidates that I like particularly, yeah, but I acknowledge would have done better. I mean, I think Pete Buttigieg yeah, would have I'd done much better. I was lying in my bed after the debate with my face in my pillow, and one of the thoughts that popped into my head was, why couldn't it have been Buttigieg? <laughs> <laughs> and I despised Buttigieg throughout the primary, but like, why couldn't it have been Buttigieg? Like Harris, Booker even like, Oh yeah. I mean, look, you know, obviously the first three names that came to mind for why couldn't it have been blank was, you know, Bernie Warren and Yang for mm -hmm. me. Yeah, of course. Like, I think that, you know, any of them probably would have ran in circles around Trump. But even if it even if it couldn't be like a progressive, like it could have at least been somebody that I'm um, is still sharp. And and yeah. look, I don't mean that as an insult on Joe Biden. I I think I I keep bringing up the fact that I thought he did wonderfully in uh, the 2012 election in the, mm -hmm. in the 2012 debate. But he has slowed down. Now, whether that is due to a cognitive condition or whether it's just due to the fact that he's old, you know, I, I don't know. But he is not as sharp as he used to be. Mm -hmm. And you really needed that against Trump. Like somebody who's just a complete shit talker like Trump, you needed somebody to really smack back. And yeah. You know, the best that Biden did was the part uh, in smacking back was the part where he just said, man, shut up. Yeah. And like when he said that, he said exactly what I was feeling. And it, but it still didn't feel satisfying. I mean, for me, like that moment was not only not satisfying, it was like. It was it was pretty early in the debate and it was just it was a moment of. Disappointment and desolation for me i was like this is where we are like we've got two candidates bickering on stage one one person tells the other the president of the united states of america to shut up because he can't even answer a question that the moderator has asked because he keeps getting interrupted it was yeah. just like such stark relief of how how dark these times are from a political perspective yeah. At one point, I half expected Biden to very slowly walk over to Trump and try to punch him. <laughs> Man, that would have been the end of everything. Oh, my God. I yeah. 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 I think yeah, another thought that kept coming to me last night was um, there are probably people around the world who watch oh, this. Oh, God. Like that, that keeps coming back to me. Like I feel so embarrassed for our nation. Yeah. embarrassed it's just yeah and and what you were talking about with like talking about the democratic primary i think is right like i think i think 
because we were largely voting against Trump, I think it led to this really weird outcome where in the Democratic Party, party, we cared way more about what we thought our neighbors thought about the candidates than what we actually thought about them ourselves. And so we ended up picking someone um, to try to like not push the people around us towards Trump yeah. as opposed to like picking someone that we actually thought would be great. And so like, you know, someone with a long political history who says relatively few things of controversy, um, maybe who's just the safest bet, but to your, but yeah, but to your point, like it seems clear like even even not comparing like biden to a a former version of himself just like compared to any of the other democratic candidates in the primary like maybe not any of them but i would have picked many of them (laughs) to be on that stage and said honestly i want to give him a break he looks he seems exhausted yeah and and he hasn't started the job yet yeah so I think like if we want to talk about like winners and losers, I think like, I guess my bet is that Biden will come out better in the polls. I think, um, you know, I think Trump is probably the two of them Trump lost, but I think we're all losers. And yeah, I, I think Trump is probably saw it. We're like, yeah, Trump was the big winner because, you know, he spent he spent the entire time dominating the conversation. Mm. But again, that's because Trumpists, you know, usually don't care as much about substance. They care about the fact that he's able to smack down people that they hate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's about the own. Yeah. Know, owning the other and, person. And that's one of the worst parts of the Trump administration, the fact that like politics has become more and more about owning the libs or Mm -hmm. owning the other person and not about finding solutions that make people's lives better. And I mean, Biden's performance based on any other bar was abysmal, but last night he showed that at least he's trying, he's trying to find solutions. He's trying to find real solutions. He's -hmm. trying to find uh, paths forward for our nation. Yeah that can take us out of the crisis crises that we face right now. Yeah. And ultimately he's an adult. Yeah. <laughs> That's a huge start. Maybe too much of one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there is potentially some light for the future debates though. I don't know if you saw this article, but the commission on presidential debates came out and said that they would be making changes to the format of the debate so that, you know, we could hear more from about policy and less um, bickering and and over talking, which, again, echoes the darkness of our times that we are having to change our debate format to get people to follow the rules on stage, the rules that they agreed to before taking the stage. But anyway, so they've said that they're going to try to take measures or, um, you know, take steps, put in place measures to, um, solve for that problem in the future debates. They haven't said exactly what those would be yet, um, but some people have speculated about, you know, potentially having mics turned off when um, it's the other person's turn to talk, which I also have talking uh, sticks now. What the hell? Yeah. Well, I I also saw this, um, this thing floating around the internet that was proposing a, a different campaign moderator, um, it was proposing uh, Samuel L. Jackson as the campaign <laughs> moderator, and, and the caption was, um, "I said two minutes, motherfucker." <laughs> <laughs> just imagine. Yeah, I, really I could work. just imagine that. That would be so hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> um, but well, not just hilarious, works. but like, you know, that might actually be effective. We might need Samuel L. Jackson to scream at our at the two people that are running for president of the United States to get him to shut up. So uh but hopefully whatever format uh they come up with will actually make the next debates less of a nightmare. Yeah. But this I mean this debate will likely go down in history as the worst 
and most toxic debate in modern presidential history. So now it's time for the high point of our episode, highlights. So Nathan, what's your highlight this week? My highlight this week is that I got a lot of schoolwork done. Like there was a lot of things that I was backed up on uh, over the weekend and also during this week with regard to uh, setting up content and uh, getting everything ready for the rest of the semester. Um, and I got all of that set up, all of that done. I'm completely caught up. And that has minimized my stress levels significantly. Uh, it doesn't mean that the rest of the semester is completely smooth sailing, but I've finally gotten things in order and I am feeling so good about it. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. What that about you, Michael? What's your really highlight? Great. So my highlight this week is actually the book I'm reading. Um, I finally picked up a copy of Middlesex by Jeffrey Eugenides. And it is about and narrated by um, this intersex character. And it is a novel, um, but it's written like a memoir in a really intriguing and relatively enchanting way. And it has just like been a, it's such an interesting experience to learn about um, like the experience of someone with a, a intersex condition and like the experience of gender and the experience of the world around them in a way that in providing a window that I would just never have and never feel comfortable, you know, asking about. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm like, I've been really enjoying getting this, this totally other perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And so with that, thank you so much for listening to the perspectrum and you'll hear from us again next week.